So when we think about the, one of the differences, and there's many, one of the differences in men and women is that guys always seem to want to fix whatever it is. We want to move on and make this as quick and as painless as possible and so we can move on to the next thing. And, and not always do, do women want to just move on and have it fixed. They just need us to listen sometimes or just need us to vent. And so even for someone like me who can't fix anything, right? Like I can barely hang a picture straight on the wall. Like I am not Mr. Handyman. And, but when it comes to my relationship or if things are happening, I'm always trying to fix everything. And so I think it's just one of those big differences and one of those things about us when we think about marriage and we think about what it looks like and what it could be like. And when we talk about marriage in the standpoint of what our marriages should really look like and what we wanted our marriages to look like, even for those of you that are single, even for those of you that aren't married or maybe um, that, that are single, we all have expectations of what we wanted our marriage to look like. Like we all went in with a certain mindset and a certain expectation of this is the way that it's going to be. Like a lot of times when I'll do premarital counseling for couples, we always talk about expectations of what she thinks marriage is going to be like and what he thinks marriage is going to be like. And a lot of times they don't even share those expectations with each other. And so for the first time in counseling, she's like, he's like, well, you're going to cook for me every night and you're going to keep the house clean and you're going to do this and all this and that. She's like, uh, I don't cook, right? And he's like what right and so there's all these different things and we walk in sometimes with certain expectations or things in our mind that we think that marriage is going to look like and what it's going to be like and then all of a sudden life starts to hit jobs and kids and stress and and tensions and all these things and houses and all these things start to come and there's all this tension and all this stress and all these things that happen and what was reality to us or, or what our expectations versus our reality of what we think marriage is going to be like is totally different. But I think that part of the problem and part of what happens sometimes in our marriages, right, and even for those of you guys that are single, like you can take a lot away from today, I hope, of what it could be and what your marriage should look like at some point later down the road. But I think what happens sometimes in our lives is that we take our eyes off of each other and we place them on ourselves or we place them on the problems that are going around us. And when we take our eyes off of the other person and their needs and their wants and how we can serve them and what we can do for them, then that changes things a little bit. Our natural tendency is to be selfish people. Our natural tendency is to what we want and, and what I need and this is what's happening now and this is your problem and you should fix this and this is how you made me mad and this is what's happening now and so you need to take care of it. And we take our eyes off of just trying to love and look at each other and we start placing it on other things and when we do that I think we lose our way. And for those of you guys that aren't married in the room today, one of those things that we talk about a lot or that I talk about a lot is just this idea of having these non-negotiables, these things in your life where you sit down and make a list of things that your spouse is going to do or your spouse is going to be like, and it's not a physical thing. Like, she can't have blue, air, blue eyes and blue hair or blonde hair, right? You may want blue hair, I don't know. Right? So blue eyes and blonde hair, or he has to look this way. It's not a physical thing, but it's more of like, I'm looking for these certain qualities in somebody. And as you date or as you, as you date and as you do things, if people don't meet those non-negotiables, then you don't, you don't let those go. You don't say, well, I really have these non-negotiables, and these are the things that I'm looking for in someone, but he's really cute, so I'm going to scratch these two off the list because I'd rather have this than that. And so you set these non-negotiables in your life, and that sets you up to be successful later down the road in your relationship. But I think what happens a lot of times for us is, like I said, we take our eyes off of each other and place them on the things that are going on around us. As a husband or as a wife, our job is to love and to serve each other. And God begins to paint a picture for us, and there's multiple scriptures throughout the Bible that talk about marriage and talk about what marriage should look like and the job of a husband and the job of a wife and all these things, and there's all these different scriptures. In Ephesians 5, one of the most quoted areas or quoted scriptures about marriage, starting in verse 22 through verse 33, it starts out Paul writing in the book of Ephesians, hey, wives should submit to their husbands. And every man pounds their chest and says, yeah, right? Wives should submit to their husbands, that the husband is the head of the wife. And then as he continues to write, he begins to say, but husbands, love your wives the way that Christ loves the church. 
That if you love your wife the way that Christ loves the church, then, 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 and, then you're going to give her somebody who's worthy submitting to. And I think, what does that even really look like for us? That when we think about our marriages and we see that, well, wives submit to your husbands and the husband is the head of the wife. What it means for us as husbands is that we're to lead our families. That we're to lead our family spiritually, that we're to set the way for our kids and the way for our wives, that we have to be the spiritual head of our house and lead in a way. That if we truly love Christ or love our wives the way that Christ loves the church, which is so unconditional, it's not made on a bunch of, well, if you do this, this, and this, and this, I'll love you. Christ loves the church. He's the head of the church, just like us as men are the head of our families. But if we love our wives the way that Christ loves the church, then we make ourselves worthy of someone who she's going to trust in the decisions that we make. She's going to not question everything that we're going to do because she knows that what we're doing as men is grounded in the Word of God and grounded in prayer. And so I think sometimes we mix that up a little bit that we're like, well, you're the wife and I'm the man and so you listen to me and this is how it's going to go down. I don't think our wives would have a problem submitting to us if we were the men that we were supposed to be and we were following Christ first. But today, that's not the scripture that I want to focus on. But I know it's one that gets talked a lot about in marriage. The scripture that I want to talk about today isn't even a scripture that isn't even really about marriage. It gets quoted a lot about marriage. It's in almost every wedding ceremony, including my own. It's in every wedding ceremony and we're all probably really familiar with it and we all love it, you know. Whether you've been in church most of your life or not, you've probably have heard these verses somewhere. But the verses aren't even designed for marriage. They're not even really about relationship. But I think we can use them in that way. But the way that Paul wrote them in the book of 1 Corinthians was he's talking about spiritual gifts. Starting in chapter 12, he's writing about spiritual gifts. And in chapter 14, he's talking about gifts again and leadership. And even continuing in chapter 13 that we're going to look at today, he's talking about spiritual gifts. It's not like all of a sudden Paul got shot by an arrow with Cupid, right? And for four verses, he just decided to write about love. Like he's writing about spiritual gifts and how we use them and what they're made to do and how we can exhort them and use them because the, the gifts are used to edify the church. That's what we have spiritual gifts for. And then all of a sudden, Paul just decided, you know what? I'm going to take a break for a minute and just write four verses about how we should love each other. Let me go back to spiritual gifts. In the scripture that we're looking at today, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth saying, hey, listen, you guys have got it all messed up. You guys are fighting amongst yourselves about your spiritual gifts. You're fighting among whose gift is better. And I have the gift of tongues or I have the gift of prophecy or I have the gift of this or I have the gift of that. And my gift is better than your gift and my gift is better than your gift. And there's all this quarreling and all this fighting amongst them. And they're missing the point of why God gave them gifts in the first place. And so all of a sudden in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verses 4 through 8, Paul says, hey, listen. It doesn't really matter what your gifts are, that if you don't love, then you're missing the point. Your gifts are worthless without love. All the things that you do are worthless without love. But when we look at this scripture and we look at it today and we break it down a little bit, I think that even though Paul is talking about it from the standpoint of what spiritual gifts and leadership should look like, like me as a leader of our church, if, if I led out of this scripture, if I lead out of love first for all of the guys that are on staff and for all of their families, if I lead out of love first, then that's going to help our relationships. It's going to help our church. It's going to make me a better leader and them a better follower of what I'm doing because they know that I love them and I have the best, my, their best interest at heart. But I think this scripture gives us a view of God. It gives us a view of who, how God loves us and how God thinks about us and how he never gives up on us. And so even though Paul is talking about it from the standpoint of, hey, all of these gifts and all these things that you have are worthless without love. For us and our marriages, I think that we can take a little bit away from it. Because in the way that God loves us, in the way that God cares for us, in the way that God shows us, That if we focus on each other and we focus on 
one another, loving each other the way that Paul describes this in the gifts and for the leadership, I think that we can walk away with something different. Our marriages could look different. The relationships we have in our life could be different. Our future marriages, for those that aren't, could be different. And so look with me today in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, starting in verse 1. And he says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I am a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to, rem- to remove mountains, mountains, but not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. And then here's the part that most of us are familiar with. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love love bears all things and believes all things and hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never ends. Paul begins to write this to the church in Corinth to say, hey, listen, that all this stuff that you have in your life, if you don't have love, it doesn't matter. And I think for us and our marriages, it's the same way. That all the things that are going on, whether it's craziness or chaotic or whether it's good or bad or the stresses and the tensions and all the things that wrap around our marriages and all the stresses that we have, that if we don't love one another and we don't have love for one another, then we're missing the point of what we're really supposed to be doing and really what our marriages are supposed to be about. And one of the things that we're going to look at today, or as I always say to you guys, if you don't remember anything else that I say, remember this, is the idea that love is not just a word, but it's an action or that it requires action. Our speaker at student camp a couple weeks ago, one night he's talking about the word love and what it looks like to love people and to love one another. And we throw around that word a lot. I love my wife, I love my kids, but I also love butter pecan ice cream, right? I also love my wife and my kids, but I also love football. So we use the word love a lot, right? We throw around the idea of I love, but when we say we love something, sometimes it gets put in the same category. I mean, obviously I love ice cream or love football, but I don't love it as much as I love my wife and my kids. But if I just tell you that I love them or that I love this, then it changes, it, like, okay. But there's something different about love. That love in our marriages, love in our relationships requires action from us. That how many times has something happened or there's been tension or argument or frustration and you later on apologize or at some point you're just like, well, I love you. It's like, well, words are cheap. Like, show me that you love me. Like, just don't tell me that you love me, but show me that you love me. Because I'm sorry and I love you don't fix everything. And so love isn't just a word that we throw around, but it's an action that we have to have. It requires action from us that we do something with the love. And so as Paul begins to tell them, listen, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. And if our goal as Christ followers is to be more like Christ, like that's what we should be pursuing for. If it's just about coming to church on Sunday mornings and worshiping, then we're missing the point. Our job as a Christ follower is to be more like Christ every single day. That's what we're growing towards. Will we ever be there? Doubtful, because we're human and we're sinful. Not until He comes back. But our job is to pursue Him and to be more like Him. And so if we're going to be more like Him, then we've got to love like Him. And that's why I believe that this gives us a picture of what, how God loves us. Because how many times has God been 
patient with us and kind? How many times has he not held the wrongdoings against us? In Psalms it tells us that the sins in your life are removed from you from as far as the east is to the west. That God doesn't keep a tally sheet and going, man, you messed up on this date and this date and this date and this date. That he removes that from us. But that if we can love the way that we're supposed to love, if we can love our spouse the way that God loves us, then it gives us a picture of what we should be like and what we should do. And so as we think about these verses... That love is patient and love is kind. It made me think about the video. Lady's got a big nail in her forehead. And all the guy can notice is the nail in her forehead. Not the problems of the headaches and how she's feeling and how she's snagging all of her sweaters and all these things. All he notices is the nail in her forehead. And he knows very quickly that he can pull that nail out and the problem will go away, right? She's not concerned about the nail on her forehead. She just wants him to sit and listen for just a minute. Love is patient and love is kind. I believe from just thinking about it in our marriages that that love listens. There's plenty of times that I know that Kim is impatient with me or that I'm impatient with her. But he's saying, hey, listen, love is patient and love is kind. Love listens. Love takes time to care about what's going on. We're patient with each other. We're patient that, hey, eventually Kevin's going to figure this out and he's going to get there, right? It's only been 20 years, but eventually he's going to get there, right? He's going to figure this out. That our, our love is patient and kind towards one another. And how often do we get caught up in the stresses and the things that are going on around us and we lose patience with each other or we don't say kind words to one another? And it gets mixed up in the mix of everything that's going on and that causes bigger problems just because we're mad or just because we're frustrated. Because we've lost our patience with people or with our spouse. But Paul tells us that love is patient and that love is kind. He tells us that love does not envy or boast, that it's not arrogant, that it's not rude. To me, I take away from that 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 means that it's not about me. Love isn't about me. Love is about her. Love is about what she needs. I'm not envy or arrogant or boastful in what I'm doing. I don't care. It's not about what I want and my needs and me being selfish in the moment because we're all selfish. Some of us more than others, but we're all selfish. It's about what I want when I want it. But love doesn't envy. It's not jealous. It's it's not boastful. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. Love isn't about us, it's about the person that we're married, the person that we're married to, the person that we're spending the rest of our life with, that that's what love is supposed to be about. It does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Maybe your translation may say that love keeps no record of wrongs. This week, if you guys are anything like my family, we have been consumed by the Summer Olympics. Anybody else, right? Our house has been consumed by the Summer Olympics. Even Kim, who's not a sports fan, is like uh, watching the Summer Olympics with us. And you guys might have heard of this guy. His name's Michael Phelps, right? I think yesterday he won his 28th medal. 23 of them are gold. Like, I mean, it's just insane. But earlier in the week, he's got this guy from South Africa, I think his name's like Claude Leclo or something like that, right? And he's trying to psych out Michael Phelps. And they're in the, in the ready room, as they call it, and they're getting ready for a prelim race, and he's in the lane next to Phelps, and Phelps is doing his thing and just listening to his music and focusing on the race, and he's in front of him shadow boxing and stretching out and doing all this stuff to Phelps, and Phelps is just like, if you saw, if you saw it, right, Phelps is like he wants to eat his children. Like his, he's just got this look on his face like, this, I'm going to crush you. And they get out to the race, and, they're, and he's still like staring at him. As Phelps is getting on to the, the diving board thing, the platform, and he's still staring at him, and Phelps isn't paying him any attention at all. And they dive into the water and they take off swimming the butterfly. I think it was the 100 meter butterfly or 200 meter butterfly, whichever race it was. Right? And they're swimming and they're doing their thing. And they're on their way back on one of the laps. And this is what you see. Put this picture up real quick, Leslie. Right? 
So Phelps is swimming, looking, focused on the goal, and Leclo, I think it's how you say his last name, Leclo is focused on where's Phelps. And needless to say, Phelps beats him. The guy didn't even end up meddling in that race, and he was one of the favorites to maybe win because he edged Phelps out four years ago. And he's focused on Phelps. And when we talk about this scripture and the idea of that God or that love keeps no record of wrong, that I think sometimes when there's wrong in our marriages or wrong in our relationships, this is what happens. Instead of being like Phelps, focused on the goal and focused on what we can do to better things, we look at our spouse watching everything that they're doing and blaming them for what's happening. And just like LaCleau, we end up losing the race. And this picture's been all over Facebook. It's been all over social media all week because this guy looked like a clown because he's in there shadow boxing and doing all this stuff, trying to psych out the greatest, probably the greatest athlete to ever live or one of them. And the, but it just made me think about when I saw the picture this week and I'm putting this message together, thinking about the idea that I know so often I do this that I've hurt Kim in some way, that I've done something wrong by her and it's my fault, but yet I'm looking at her like it's her fault and she needs to change instead of being focused on the goal ahead, which is bettering my marriage and showing her the love that I need to show her. How often are we guilty of this? Maybe not even in our marriages, but just in other relationships and other friendships that we're focused on the other person and what their fault is and what they're doing instead of focused on how we can better ourselves. And so when we talk about the idea that love is not just a word, but that it requires actions from us. Paul begins to lay out this idea of what's happening. But he gets to this part where he begins to tell us all the things that love is and all the things that love is not. Love is patient and kind. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It's not boastful. It doesn't insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It doesn't keep a record of wrongdoing. It doesn't rejoice at the wrongdoing. Like if if Kim messes up, I don't go back and say, See, I told you I was right. You were wrong and I was right. Love doesn't do that. But he gets to this part in verse 7 where he says, Love bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love bears all things. To me, I interpret that and take that the way that that means love puts up with a lot. That no matter what the world throws our way or no matter what we cause in ourselves or the the dumb decision that we may make or the nail that's in our forehead or whatever may be going on in our marriages and in our relationship, that love bears all things, that love puts up with all things. It means that somehow, some way, there's a way to move past it. That some way, somehow, there's a way to better it in the end. That love bears all things. It's crazy to me when you look at the divorce rates in the world that we live in. But it's even crazier to me when you look at the the divorce rates inside the church. They're worse inside the church than they are outside the church. And we got to fix that. We're at the nursing home a couple weeks ago at camp. We're having these conversations with these people. And like, yeah, my husband passed away a year ago. I'm like, how long were you guys married? 55 years. 60 years. I could just look at these people and I'm like, man, I want that. Like Kim and I are happy because we're moving close to 20, right? And there's a few people in here that are over that, but we're getting there. These people have been married for 60 years. You don't think that they had issues and problems and all these things that happened, but if you don't think that they didn't live this out for each other, that they weren't kind and patient and not rude and not arrogant, not boastful, not keeping record of wrongs, that love bears all things. It hopes all things. I took that, that that means that we dream together. You sit in a room with your husband or with your wife and you don't have expectations and don't have dreams of where you could go and what could happen. We're just going through day by day. We don't have hope of what the future looks like. We're missing it. 
Sometimes the dreams need to be reeled in, right? Right? Because all I do is dream. Tim's like, just focus, like, here for a moment. Instead of 15 years down the road, like, just focus. But it hopes all things. It dreams together. You've got to have hopes together. You've got to know where you're going. You've got to know what it's supposed to look like. You've got to know where you want to go in your relationship. It hopes all things. And then he says it endures all things. Life's going to throw you curveballs. Life's going to throw you all kinds of craziness. You're going to have good weeks and you're going to have bad weeks. You're going to have weeks where one of you is stressed out and you're going to have weeks where both of you are stressed out. And every couple in the room handles stress differently. Every woman and every man in the room handles stress differently. If you're anything like us, like I just turn inward. Like, I just shut down. Like, I just don't show any emotion. I'm just kind of disconnected from the world around me because I'm trying to process and think through the stress and the things that are happening, right? Kim's different than that. We all handle it differently, but he says that we endure all things, but love endures all things together. The things that happen in our marriage, the things that are going on, the things that we've been through over the time that Kim and I have been together, there's no way that we could have endured endured those things, one, without God, and two, without each other. Like for so long, I felt like I knew what marriage was supposed to be like, that I wasn't a Christian. You guys, most of you all know my story. I didn't give my life to Jesus until I was like 28 or 29 years old trying to figure out what it looked like to follow God. If I just worked a lot and made a lot of money and took care of my family, then I was good. And then something happens and God radically changes my life and everything changes in my marriage because now we're focused on God and who He is and what He has for us and it helps us endure the things that we're going through. It hopes all things. Our hope should be in Christ. But then I love how he ends in verse 8. He says, love never ends. There's never an ending point to love. And so often we stop our love in the moment. So often we decide that we can't love you anymore. That when all the stresses come and everything else happens, jobs are going to change and and, and cars are going to change and homes may change and all these things may change. At some point for those of us that have kids or will have kids, eventually we pray that they move out, right? That they don't stay at home until they're 40, That they get a job and they move out. So everything in our life changes. Things come and go, but the one thing that Paul is saying never ends is love. Love can never end. And when we think about love, and we think about our marriages, and we think about what we should do, and how we should be, and what they could look like, and how we can make them better, regardless of how bad they may be, or how good they may be, They can always be better. Just like our relationship with God, no matter where we are, no matter how good we are, no matter how solid we think we are, no matter whether we think we're on the mountaintop at the moment with God, our relationship with God can always be better and our relationship with our spouse can always be better. Love bears all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never ends. We talk about this series and this idea of family matters. Last week, we introduced you the idea of why our family ministry is important to us, why we want to have great children's ministry and great kids' city is going to be awesome and how youth is going to be awesome and why we use the strategy orange of the family and the church working together. That it's not just your job as the parent, it's not just our job as church staff, but if we work together, we can make a difference in your family if we can make a difference in our marriages, then that's going to change things. Family matters. Our marriages matter. And so my hope and my prayer this morning is that we would love the way that Paul tells us that we should love, the way that he's telling the church in Corinth, hey, listen, it doesn't matter what your gifts are. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter what you have and what God's gifted you with. If you don't love, then it's pointless. It doesn't matter in our marriages if we don't have love, we're missing it. 
if we don't love the way that Paul tells us we should love. I believe every couple in this room love each other. But are we loving like this? Because this is the picture of how we're supposed to love. And so I want to ask you guys this morning to just close your eyes for me for just a minute and bow your heads.